Scott, and I would like to give the floor to Natalie discussing Qatar in Central Asia, what is at stake in Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. organizers and to everybody who's been suffering in this increasingly warm room. Uh, all right, so I have been working in the Arabian Peninsula for about five years and uh, in Central Asia for about 12 years. So I first started to get interested in the Gulf region because of uh, a sort of approach of thinking about capital city development comparatively. But as I started to do that work, I found that there was uh, a striking number of connections and flows between the two regions uh, that needed a lot more attention that a lot of scholars have tended to overlook. Uh, and I hope that this is kind of moving in, in that particular direction. And I should also add that I proposed to write this memo uh, before the blockade began in June. So it has a little bit uh, different flavor than I originally wanted because I do want to talk about what the blockade has meant for, uh, for these sorts of relations and for the lessons that the Central Asian leaders are taking from what is happening to Qatar right now. Uh, so, first of all, the, the question that I started with originally was why is, why is Qatar getting involved in Central Asia? And I wanted to do that through looking at three particular case countries. Uh, so, many of us that are sort of watching Central Asia know that Qatar's involvement in the region initially started uh, more with sort of that language of uh, religious and cultural unity and brotherhood on that account. So there has been certainly a number of Qatari-funded projects, uh, the first being the Nuristana project in Astana, uh, funded by the Qataris for uh, a mosque. And that opened in 2005 and was initiated in 1999. Uh, there's also an ongoing mosque construction project in Dushanbe. Uh, this picture was taken this summer to give you a sense of that. It's, it's been quite, quite a long time and going on. So religious narratives are significant in sort of framing some of this relationship, but there's actually a lot more uh, going on in the region in terms of what the Qataris are interested in, in getting involved in Central Asia and vice versa, what the Central Asian leaders are interested in getting from uh, working with Qatar. Okay, so in this analysis, I've, I've tended to find that the Qataris do have a number of interests, uh, but more than anything, I think a lot of their engagement in Central Asia is reflective of the broader Qatari approach to extreme internationalism, uh, of engagement globally and with a lot of different partners, which sounds quite familiar uh, to many of us who study uh, the Central Asian states and their sort of multi-vector uh, foreign policies, right? That is, that is a major uh, theme running through, uh, th running through the foreign policies of the Central Asian leaders. So the Qataris, this has been central to their agenda from, uh, for, for many, many years, and indeed I would say uh, perhaps longer and more thoroughly and perhaps just with more cash uh, in, in Qatar. So uh, they, by and large, seem to be willing to let some of their partners in Central Asia uh, set the agenda for certain things that, that they might be interested in, while more often uh, just trying to keep, a, keep an open door to possible uh, relations that might, that might uh, benefit them further down the road. So I'll just talk a, a briefly about each of the each of the three countries that I uh, that I touch on here, and then we'll move on to what the what the blockade has meant uh, and those those lessons that we take it now it now being 100 days um, today is the 100th day of of uh, Qatar's blockade. Okay. 
so first of all, in uh, in Dushan Bay, as I mentioned, uh, one of the, the most significant projects that you can see the Qatari presence actually built into the landscape is this new mosque that is going up. Uh, and this has been really a pet project of Rahman's. Uh, this is something that he has really sort of pushed and uh, even spent his 59th birthday initiating the construction of, of the mosque. Uh, and this is something that I've written elsewhere uh, with fellow Ponar's colleague um, Anar Baliev about monumental mosques, mosque projects uh, more generally is that in these cases where we see these sorts of monumental, huge investments in uh, over $100 million mosque project, that this is, is very much tending to divert attention from the sort of smaller scale repression of free practice uh, of religion in the country. So at the same time that we uh, see this big project going up, uh, we also see the, the clamping down that is continuing to go on in Tajikistan uh, in terms of the smaller scale practices of religion. So to have the Qataris uh, fund this and to put their name on it and to help provide those funds, uh, this tends to uh, sort of bolster the claim of Rahman's sort of Islamic credentialism, if, if you want to call it that. Uh, and for the Qataris, it seems to be quite a low-cost way of uh, making an ally in the region should that, uh, should that become useful. Uh, whereas they're not really, at this moment, uh, interested in doing too much in terms of bilateral exchanges. So Ramon was visiting in, in um, Doha in February of this year, and he was touting all sorts of things that the Qataris should get behind and fund, uh, but ultimately it really just amounted to uh, a bunch of memorandums of understanding, so MOUs, uh, that didn't have any real political weight. Uh, so it seems here in, in this particular case that having that, um, that vague degree of partnership is uh, sort of seen as a, let's keep that door open. Uh, in Turkmenistan, here we can we can talk about a, a number of different issues. I'll just highlight uh, a few things. So, like Rahman, who also he, uh, Berdy Mukhamidov also visited uh, Qatar in the in the earlier part of this year, and he was also trying to get Qatari investment in a whole range of projects, uh, basically anything and everything that they that they would be interested in. He was he was willing to put forward, uh, but that said he did really try to push two particular items. Uh, one was the uh, this Turkmenbashi international seaport that uh, Berdy Mohamedov has been behind and is trying to advance. This has been uh, supposedly, it was supposed to be funded largely by Turkish money. Uh, this funding seems to have sort of gone awry and that's why outside observers are suspecting that, uh, that he is going now to the Qataris in hopes that he can kind of keep this, keep this multi-billion dollar project alive. Uh, the Qataris don't seem interested at this point, uh, and probably rightfully so. They have a huge investment portfolio uh, that, that would entail much less risk than going to Turkmenistan. Uh, the other big issue that's sort of at, at play between Qatar and Turkmenistan is the Tapi pipeline. Uh, so that's kind of the, the red pipeline that you see there. And Verdi Mukhamidov has been keen to push this forward, to make this happen. So it's connecting uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, for those of you who are familiar. So Turkmenistan, as most of you know, has huge gas reserves. I mean, that is its primary export. Well, the same can be said of Qatar. Whereas the other Arabian Peninsula states tend to have oil, Qatar has the gas reserves. Qatar also has, uh, as a consequence, uh, or perhaps, well, a confluence of factors, uh, has a monopoly on South Asian and Southeast Asian uh, gas markets. Okay, so to the Qataris, they see this in large part as a, as a potential challenge to that. If the Turkmen uh, gas starts to get exported to South Asia, this could be seen as a problem. And so this, this sort of tension uh, really came into focus just uh, basically a couple days after uh, Berry Mohamedov 
uh, announced a new initiation of the Tapi Pipeline construction project in, uh, in early 2016. Within a couple of days, the Qataris were there in Ashgabat and meeting, uh, uh, meeting with so that was, I mean, at the, at the highest level, right? Sheikh Tamim, who's the current emir of, of Qatar, was there, uh, and and I think the the big agenda there is to try and put that to an end. Um, so moving on then quickly to Kazakhstan, be mindful of time. Uh, Kazakhstan has much more substantial sort of connections with Qatar at this stage, in large part for uh, for its diversity of uh, of projects, including uh, sports, education, culture, etc. They are also quicker to get uh, get in cooperation with the Qataris. There. I'll, I'll just touch on one particular item uh, because this kind of transitions to, uh, to what's going on with the blockade right now. In uh, 2007, in February 2007, the Qataris and the Kazakhstanis signed a bilateral agreement protecting the Hubara Bustard. Anybody know what the Hubara Bustard is? Probably a lot of us don't. The Hubara Bustard is uh, a endangered bird species, it's protected, internationally protected bird species that falcon hunters treat as their prized prey. So uh, those of you who know me know I'm doing research on falconry, uh, so this obviously has to, has to come into the story, and it, and it does in an, in an interesting way. So they signed this agreement in 2007 on the protection of the bird, uh, and it is also then significant that in fact, the Kazakhstani law <laughs> is that if you want to hunt in the wild, if you want to get a license to falcon hunt in the wild, you have to have documented, uh, basically documented that you are undertaking protection efforts or efforts to preserve local species related to the sport. So this is the Kazakhstani sort of requirement uh, for wild falcon <coughs> hunting. So that agreement was signed in, 20, in 2007, and in fact, uh, for Sheikh Tamim in particular, his fa I'm not, I couldn't figure out if Sheikh Hamad had actually been to Kazakhstan for falcon hunting, uh, but for Sheikh Tamim, this was, it has become uh, an extremely popular destination for uh, falconry hunting. And this also comes at a moment when, well, I'll say maybe a set of years, right, uh, where a lot of the traditional places for the Gulf uh, elite to go hunt have been increasingly getting pushed out. So uh, in Pakistan in particular, that was where most of the falcon hunters used to go. Uh, there have been civil, uh, civil protests and opposition to falconry uh, in, in those countries that have meant that the Gulf leaders are looking for new places to go. Uh, so Kazakhstan and I would say also Turkmenistan, that's a little bit more off the books, um, but these these Gulf elites are going and traveling uh, to to this region uh, to hunt, and this is no small uh, amount of money that's going into this. Uh, they'll spend perhaps $20 million on any given trip with an entourage of 200 or 300 people. Um, so this also sort of came into light, uh, some of you guys may have noticed the news in September 2016, uh, when the Sheikh traveled to Kazakhstan uh, and two of his falcons died at the Almaty airport. These are birds that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so the, the sheikh was supposed to spend two weeks in Kazakhstan and cut his trip short after three days uh, and was absolutely furious. So I'm not sure if that will be uh, a point of bilateral cooperation going forward, uh, but we shall see. Um, but the, the precarity of the situation with falcon hunting is it has been uh, really significant for the Qataris in particular recently because yet yeah, another news item that may have flashed across your screens but the dots don't always connect uh, is that in 2015, December 2015, 27 Qatari falcon hunters uh, and royal, royal family members and their entourage, 27 of them were taken hostage in Iraq. So they had been held hostage until spring of this year. Uh, and this is in fact what some commentators and 
I can't independently verify this. Uh, some of the commentators suspect that the hostage deal that the Qataris signed to release those royal family members and others is precisely the straw that broke the camel's back that uh, sort of led to the blockade initially. So that was in April uh, of this year that a $1 billion ransom payment was, was doled out. Uh, and as far as observers know, this money went to primarily, about $700 million went primarily to uh, Iranian-backed militias and other Islamic terrorist groups. So this is kind of the, the big point uh, that it, that connects us, you know, to, to see the relevance of, you know, so, something like uh, falcon hunting may, may seem slightly irrelevant, but when it results in a $1 billion ransom payment, yes, it's significant. Um, so, what, again, I, I can't personally say whether this is really the issue at hand uh, for the blockade. It's certainly one item that at least bolsters the claims of the other GCC members who are saying, you know, look, Qatar is funding terrorism. Um, beyond that, I mean, I can certainly answer more questions on this uh, in, in the Q&A, but beyond that, yes, this, this does seem to be uh, a major issue that the Central Asian leaders are also looking at, because as we've seen with the blockade, uh, that all of these sort of air, tra air travel, sea travel, land travel, all of these networks have really isolated the country. But as most of us know, if we think about Qatar, we think about its soft power strategy and treating that as a tool of diplomacy of securing its sovereignty. Well, if their sovereignty is not being necessarily protected by this soft power campaign and extreme multi-vector uh, sort of policies that we see at work in Central Asia as well. Um, this is certainly something that those Central Asian leaders are watching, and I, I hope. Well, I don't know. Actually, probably the, the opposite. Don't hope. Um, but they're, they're, you know, they're they're looking at this and seeing that the the limits of a soft power strategy that uh, you know has not been able to translate into ending the blockade, it being uh, now 100 days later. All right, I'm sure I'm over time. Apologies. Thanks. So we have about half an hour for the discussion. So we will process as usually. We will collect several questions. Please wait for the mic, and then uh, um, we will collect some. So I saw here first. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the presentations. I have one comment on Sean's paper on Uzbekistan, and also I have a question to Scott Reynolds. The comment is that you said that Uzbekistan Karimov's economic model is unsustainable. I would actually say that it is the most sustainable economic model in all post transition space, except for the Chinese. This is the most successful country from an economic point of view. Not only the dynamics of output in Uzbekistan was better than in other countries, but also they achieved quite a breakthrough in structural shifts in the economy. Now, it's only four countries that are the leaders, and Uzbekistan is one of those. Azerbaijan, the first one is Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Uh, China, of course, goes number one. And, uh, you know, Belarus is somewhere close. If you look at the output today as compared to 1989, Recently, they were growing at 7%, which is the exceptional record among transition economies. Also, they achieved structural shifts like they cut in half the production of cotton and achieved the uh, food self-sufficiency. They became a self-sufficient energy country. Now, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan are doing very well, but they are doing this on energy, on exports of oil and gas. Uzbekistan is just self-sufficient in energy, so it's half resource country, but they are very successful. And in addition, they created auto industry from scratch, right? Which is the only example, except for China, of manufacturing exports. Uh, I'll stop here. The question to Scott, very short one. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, when you uh, think about conspiracy theories is that this is associated with a level of education. Uh, uh, maybe I missed it, but you didn't say about it. And can you elaborate on the international comparisons? You said there are about 30 and someone else, right? So. Maybe you can speak about it. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Eric, Sasha, and Eric. Uh, uh, a few quick questions. First, um, Natalie, uh, 
I was I was fascinated with the um, Tajik uh, mosque building, um, and I, I, it was the only example where you didn't articulate a pressing thing that uh, was desired from from the investment. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if, if there might be something, uh, and I'm, I'm contrasting this to the Aga Khan uh, efforts to win building beautiful, big uh, mosques, um, uh, but also doing a lot of other things. So uh, might Kyler actually want something here, and what might that be? And, and ultimately, might it come back and bite Rock One uh, in the end? Because it certainly has to with, with, with uh, the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, uh, Scott, I, I was curious with your concluding statement. Uh, and you said that you think Georgians are more inclined towards conspiracy because they have a jaundiced view of democracy. I think that's what you said. Politics. Or politics. Um, and and I, uh, I'm curious if that's the conclusion that you are deriving from this survey or if that's uh, something that you're extrapolating. Is this something that, that is, uh, you found in your empirical analysis or is this kind of, okay, I got this data, uh, what could possibly explain the variation? Um, and then uh, I have a slightly different take on the Uzbek economy than my colleague. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, Sean, I wanted you, uh, if possible, to talk a little bit more about the economics. And what I'm particularly interested in is, you know, the, the Uzbek economic model that I most understand is where you invite outside investors in, uh, they put in hundreds of millions, if not millions of dollars, uh, and then you um, you know, the, the company that, that your daughter has sold to them, you then expropriate 10 years down the, down the road. Uh, and it's a, it's a curious economic model. I'm seeing is, has there been any reverse of that economic model? That is, has the state uh, begun to turn some of these stolen properties back over to the international investors? Okay, and then we have Katy here, and then we will Kathy Cosman. Um, my question is to Sean. Um, I've heard reliable reports from Uzbek NGOs that the total number of estimated uh, political and religious, mostly independent Muslims, prisoners in Uzbekistan is 12,500. Um, is there any group that's keeping track of the actual numbers going down? Um, and do you foresee any change in the law as opposed to re-examining cases? of extremism. Thank you. Okay, so let's take these three questions and then we will try to do two more rounds because we have at least six other questions coming. Sean, do you want to begin? Sure. All right, so first on uh, Uzbekistan's economy. I mean, I think one of the, I, I uh, actually, a lot of my research for this happened as part of one of those uh, uh, government contract research projects that um, came up under um, Celeste Wallander's um, discussion questions. And uh, I did an assessment for USAID. One of the things that came up when we were looking at economic issues is none of the data from Uzbekistan is reliable. Um, I mean, I, I think also if we look at, if you're, if you're saying also Turkmenistan is sustainable, we're seeing right now that Tur Turkmenistan is virtually falling apart economically. And um, I do think that one of the things that's really pushing these reforms is essentially economic. Um, to answer um, the question about graft, I think that's a, it, it's it's the big question now after currency conversion. And um, obviously, the plan to first start with the courts seems to be dealing with legal questions. They, they, I think the, the thing that the Uzbek government wants most is foreign investment because um, they've really isolated their economy. The currency conversion made it really difficult for foreign companies to do anything in the country. If they're producing anything for the local market, they had no way to convert that back into hard currency. Um, but then the other issue is things like people taking over companies. So, um, I don't think there's been anything specific now, but you can certainly see a struggle going on. That's why I mentioned the state-owned enterprises, because those are also, they're state-owned, but they're also obviously run by particular figures within the, the uh, higher echelons of the government. Um, and in terms of um, 
religious prisoners and prisoners of conscience and so on. Um, I mean, I've been following some of what Human Rights Watch is looking at, you know, and they're following some of the high profile people. Um, I don't think that there's been um, much else done, uh, and I think that it's, um, this is a, a big question, but I also do think that the Uzbek government is cognizant of it. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't believe that they would be doing these things that they're doing. They're trying to, I think they're cognizant of the threat that exists because of their previous attitudes towards religion. And so they're really trying to uh, deal with that issue. Again, the National Security Service and its powerful leader, Rustam Inayatov, is probably somebody who uh, could be a barrier to that happening. So it's something to watch very closely. So, oh, oh. <coughs> so on the question of um, demographic predictors of conspiracism, uh, you might be surprised. So in Georgia, more conspiratory people tend to be better educated and younger. In Kazakhstan, neither variable was significant, and income had no effect in either country. In terms of international comparisons, um, so on, I'm not gonna say any numbers, but on the question of, of whether secret groups are really controlling things, both countries far more conspiratorial than Americans. Global warming, both countries more conspiratorial than the UK. I don't have data on the US because it wasn't asked in exactly the way. I could probably find it. My guess is it would be comparable. Maybe Americans would be more conspiratorial on that. Uh, on the question of uh, whether the government conceals information on par with the UK. And 9-11 is kind of all over the place. Jordan's are very low, Kazakhstan is very high. So it's kind of hard to generalize, although on the whole, on most questions, I think these countries do end up scoring higher on, on conspiracy theories. Uh, and then Eric's question about what's going on in Georgia. Um, so, so I remember this partly theoretically, and then uh, I can document it empirically. Uh, I wouldn't generalize that, uh, so I think there's a reason why competitive <clears throat> regimes are more likely to lead people to have jaundiced views of politics, which in turn leads them to suspect that powerful people can do nefarious things. Uh, and especially in an unconsolidated democracy, right, where politics is a blood sport, it's easy to understand right, why people might think this way. Even in a consolidated democracy like our own, ideas, right, in the course of competitive politics, Politicians have incentives to um, make, right, lead people to suspect conspiracies about their political opponents. We don't need a better demonstration than that. Um, it doesn't mean democracies are always working towards but I think there's kind of a, there's a commonsensical idea that it's dictatorships that are more conspiratorial because elites use conspiracy theories to distract people and keep them in line and brainwash them. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, empirically, um, the variables that explain most of, of the difference between um, Georgia and Kazakhstan, or, or why, why Georgians are more experienced with the Kazakhstanis, are that Georgians have lower institutional trust, uh, believe their country is less democratic, have lower levels of uh, approval of the current government, and have lower levels of efficacy, which means that they have less faith that the individuals can influence politics. So all four of those variables are significant and help explain why Jordans are, are the way they are. Uh, thanks, Eric, for the question. You went straight to the, the one point I, I wasn't so confident I had a great answer for, uh, which is specifically what do the Qataris want in Tajikistan. My, my interpretation of that really ended up kind of um, ending up in this idea of trying to keep an open door for future cooperation. So the only other project that uh, that they have going on in Tajikistan is uh, the so the parastatal Qatari DR uh, company. It's a real estate development company. Uh, they have uh, luxury residences called the DR de Chambe. And this seems to me to be something of a testing ground to see how um, to see how these projects are aren't working if they're viable uh, in, in the country and to keep that uh, door open. That said, I would, I would also sort of add with the, with the Moss project in particular that the Qataris have been very keen to promote an image of themselves as uh, sort of enacting 
modern Islamic forms of charity uh, and crafting that image is something that they've strategically tried to do in, in all countries in, in their neighborhood, uh, but especially countries that sort of nominally claim that identity of being an Islamic country. So part of it is certainly about that sort of Islamic credentialism, not just for Afghan, but also for the Qataris. Uh, and, and what that looks like often sort of takes shape in these, these smaller projects, which may lead to something in, in the future. Uh, beyond that, I'm, I'm relatively uncertain and I would be happy to chat with you about uh, what else they might they might get uh, from it in the future and the question of will it backfire in the future uh, there there again I'm not entirely sure I mean if you're referencing specifically the, the mosque uh, they very strategically cite, cited it on the outskirts of the city uh, as as we see with a number of monumental projects mosque projects in uh, in a number of the other sort of post-Soviet countries uh, that they that they're good and they're beautiful and they photograph well uh, but they're also very hard to get to for worshipers uh, who are used to having that sort of daily experience more ingrained in their their neighborhood community good so let's go for a second round of Christian there are more and more coming so I had Maya there in the back then Ed then Steve Thank you. Um, I have a quick question, or actually an alternative explanation to consider for Barbara for this phenomenon that you found in your survey where uh, Kazakh youth seems to embrace democracy more so than their Kazakh uh, Kyrgyz counterparts. Um, could this be the knowledge of English? Because we know that the Kazakh government has made a concerted effort to introduce English, the study of English, into their high school curriculum and, of course, the university curriculum. And public policy research shows that um, learning about something in, like, learning about democracy in English, you know, meaning that's lots Yes, meaning gets lost in translation, but if you learn about something like democracy in English, including through social media, even if your English is just rudimentary, it's actually making you more likely to embrace those precepts and principles and values. So just uh, something to think about. And then a comment and a question for Sean. Uh, so last time I was in Uzbekistan, I had a uh, conversation with the director of the National Democratic Institute there, and he said something startling. He said that, uh, uh, Uzbek politicians uh, were more democratic than politicians in other uh, republics of Central Asia, um, in the sense that they were much more conscientious about what they were doing when they were communicating with the constituents. So there were like lots of things that they were doing. They were doing it in very conscientious um, manner. So my question to you is whether what we are seeing today is actually a continuation of what's been going on for a while and how long are we going to be able to see that, uh, given that the Reserve Administration is still trying to consolidate its regime and there is some turnover. So once it's all consolidated, and if there are any perception of threat to that regime, will it all come to a halt? Ed? Thanks, um, Ed Shaz, University of Toronto. Just a, a few quick questions, I'll try to keep them very brief. Um, Sean, to you, um, you, you talked at the end about the international community and what it might do. I want to encourage you to flesh that out a little bit. Um, particularly, I'm wondering who you mean by international community and what you might mean by praise, and whether or not that could have unintended consequences, linking up to some of the things Scott was talking about. All right, he's asking some of the conspiracy theories, so might it not be better for at least some prominent members of the international community to just sit back and let good things happen. Right? So that's, a, that's an open possible way. Um, the second question uh, is both for Barbara and Scott. I'm wondering about the you know, institutions of, of democracy or of you know, a, a more liberalized autocracy, uh, in, in, you know, as, as, as Sean suggests, is the, is the most likely outcome in, um, in Uzbekistan, particularly political parties. Uh, I guess one of the questions that Barbara asked sort of talked maybe indirectly about opposition parties, but um, you know, the key thing here is how do you move from a de facto monopoly of a particular political party, uh, you know, the Nurultan party pretends to be very embarrassed about their overwhelming control in parliament, whether or not they you know, really feel that uh, very deeply is a separate kind of question. How do you move from this kind of situation where there's a de facto monopoly by a particular party into something resembling greater competition, a slightly more level playing field uh, for, for, that seems to me would be a, a signal uh, change. Um, final thing real quick is actually on the cotton question. I wonder, and maybe I missed in the presentation, John, is there, do you see any signs or is it part of the detailed plan to move 
even more dramatically away from cotton, because that to me would be uh, you know, part and parcel of both liberalization in terms of you know, relations with neighbors. I mean, if, if that seems to me sort of a linchpin of many of these reforms. Okay, we have Steve Blank. Uh, Stephen Blank, American Foreign Policy Council. My question is for Scott. Um, to what degree do elites in government in the countries you've studied believe in these conspiracy theories? And can you find any connection between those beliefs and actual policy outputs? You know, we always get the question here in Washington, how can the Russians really believe what they're saying? Uh, you have to explain to people that perhaps they do. Uh, and therefore, did you find that in Georgia and Kazakhstan and in any other country you may have studied? Okay, Mikhail Mamed of Georgetown in US. Well, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Well, my first question about Kyrgyz, uh, about Poles in Kyrgyz and Kazakhstan. Well, as far as I see, there is kind of difference about four, four, three, sometimes five percent. Well, recent polls in the United States predicted victory of Hillary Clinton, but you know, as a result, now we have Donald Trump. Whoops, oops. And well, how much do you think it could be some kind of statistical mistake? Maybe, maybe this is basically. Well, I'm sorry to say that. Maybe this is basically very close to the same thing. Now, the second question is to Scott. Well, he did not say anything about uh, conspiracy theories in Azerbaijan. Well, in Azerbaijan, everything generally is attributed to Armenian. Armenians were behind of everything. Armenians were behind the massacre in Sungait in 1988. Uh, Turkish genocide of 1915 was also a result of Armenian. Well, it also was Armenian, made by Armenians. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on and go on. Well, thank you so much. and. Thank you. Okay, sure. um, I'll, I'll pass on the question about parties in Kazakhstan. I'll leave it back to where we're Steve's question about elites. So separately, I'm also um, collecting um, conspiracy theories in Russian language newspapers going back to 1995 for the whole region and I'm coding them according to who's making the accusation, uh, who's the purported conspirator, who's the victim, what nationality they are, et cetera. Uh, one thing, it's not, the data set isn't done yet, but there are a lot more of these in Georgia than in Kazakhstan. Russia, of course, is number one. Uh, they come from all different sources. A lot of them come from various elites. It's a parlor game whether politicians actually believe anything they say. <laughs> you know, we don't really know. Um, I, I don't know how you would know. Um, one thing that comes to mind is uh, in some of the WikiLeaks cables, diplomats reported, uh, I found one in Afghanistan about a uh, uh, conversation with Karzai, where Karzai is basically out of his mind and paranoid. And so in private speech, you can find elites possibly telling what they really think. But again, if they're talking to an American diplomat, is that you even know if that's really what they believe. So, be, so seeing as how we don't know what they believe, the most we can study is what they say and what effects that have. It's very difficult to link any kind of claim with any particular policy outcome, but in the aggregate, I mean, you could look at a campaign, you could look at, uh, right, when, um, when a politician decides to demonize a particular person or group over a long period of time and then takes in some kind of action against that group. Azerbaijan might be a good example of that. Um, so there's something there, right? There's a kind of preparation there. There's kind of uh, shaping the policy space and setting the agenda in ways that make people support that policy. Um, but you don't, it's not only conspiracy that does that, right? Ordinary political rhetoric, ordinary demonization, um, propaganda can also have that effect. Uh, so so I, it's hard to link conspiracy theories to particular uh, policy outcomes, but um, you know, you know, politicians are crafty and conspiracy theory is one tool in their toolbox. Thank you, Thank you for the questions. Um, about English, hmm, that's a hard one. So one of the reasons why we chose specifically those questions is because they're not about democracy as an abstract concept, but they're about particular things. Um, so that was our attempt at trying to get around that problem of different interpretations of democracy. Um, it is true that students in Kazakhstan are supposed to learn 
English, they're supposed to know Russian, they're supposed to know Kazakh, they're supposed to know Chinese, right? According to government, um, multi-vectorism, right? Uh, citizens all have to know these different languages. I'm not sure how much students actually gain proficiency in English. And the reason I say that is because uh, when we lived in Kazakhstan, my daughter went to a Russian school, a local school, and the English that they were learning in sixth grade uh, was pretty not very, I mean, the students did, couldn't speak English, and they had an English Olympiad, and the teacher asked my daughter, who's a native speaker of English, to represent the school in the Olympiad. And, they, <laughs> and the teacher said, well, but she, you look Kazakh, and you have a Kazakh name, and no one will know. <laughs> she also said, if you do this for us, we'll give you special free tutoring and math. <laughs> I think it's also interesting because uh, I taught for two years at Nazarbayev University, which is an English language um, uh, institution in Astana, Kazakhstan, and the students, you know, they have varying levels of English, but the, when I asked them in one of my classes to write a paper about um, what, how has politics affected their lives, how have they affected politics, many of my students said things like, you know, we're different from our parents' generation, we, have, we know English, we know all these languages, we can... We travel, we read things, we're more democratic, and then the results showed actually that young people are less democratic than other generations. I thought that was really interesting. It's a really interesting alternative explanation. I have to think about it a little bit more. Um, in terms of institutions and moving from a party monopoly to something resembling greater competition, I was trying to look it up. I don't have it on this computer, but um, trust in institutions, government institutions is generally very high in Kazakhstan. Um, but when it comes to even pro-government political parties, trust in, in institutions is much lower. So it goes like presidents, 90-something, right? Um, parliament, things that are, are far away from people are generally in the government are very trusted. Um, and then other things like the, the military is medium trusted, political parties are less trusted, pro-government political parties are people don't trust. Um, the military, I mean, sorry, the police and the judiciary at the least. So those two, those three at the end are low trust. So I think parties just don't really play that important role in, in, in politics at all. So I'm not sure so if that's the case, if people don't trust government, pro-government pro um, parties and they don't trust opposition parties, and I'm not really sure how you move. That's an important question, but I don't have that answer to it. And then the statistical mistake. Mm, so my co-authors are better at the statistics part than I am, but um, it had those little stars next to it. <laughs> um, and also we have a 95% confidence thing in Barbara that tells us that it's not a mistake. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. <laughs> So uh, I don't know if I would characterize Uzbek politicians as the most democratic in the region, but they can be they can be some of the most effective. Um, you know, if if the econ if I don't think the economy is necessarily has been very sustainable, it, it has had a very sustainable governance model where where bureaucrats um, do engage citizens and uh, do try to deliver services because they it, it it is still very much um, kind of a society that uh, is reminiscent of the Soviet Union in this way where people um, in government respond to uh, trying to provide for citizens so I mean that that is a positive thing that but I think another point which is important that you bring up uh, Maria is that the um, Reforms, in, to some degree, seem to have started in 2013. Um, at that point, very surprisingly, somebody from the Uzbek embassy came to me and asked me to go give a talk in Tashkent at the Uzbek parliament on multi-party democracy. And I said, well, you know, you should know, I don't really think you guys have a multi-party democracy. He said, no, 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 don't talk about Uzbekistan. Just talk about, like, theoretically what that looks like. Um, and so, you know, there was the, there was there were these attempts to uh, start implementing some sort of liberalization er, earlier. Okay, um, but I don't think I, you know it's hard to really it's reading tea leaves to try to understand what's happening in um, inside Uzbek government policy making because it's so opaque. But. Um, I do think that they have real reason to continue these reforms, at least 
uh, because they're very concerned about creating jobs and they're very concerned about foreign investment. So they and they seem to understand that they need a uh, rule of law that will guarantee um, foreign investment. They need convertible currency. Um, they need at least uh, a certain liberal attitude in society, maybe not really democracy, but um, they need to have some sort of accountability in particular. There's a lot of things going on trying to get politicians to be more accountable. The parliamentarians now are being forced to go out monthly and have constituent meetings. Um, and one of the real first uh, initiatives of the new president was to start this um, large kind of feedback loop with the <coughs> citizens online and that continues and they actually respond to complaints about you know specific public clinic or specific school or something that's taking bribes and so on so um, I, I, I think that um, if in fact the the people who are in favor of these reforms can can uh, hold back those who are against them. I think that it, it's fairly uh, sustainable, but that's, that's a big if. Um, Ed, your question I think is, is well taken. When I had meetings with gov government officials, you know, they, they were not asking for help. But when I said, well, US, because I was looking at what USAID might do more of now in Uzbekistan, that there were these openings and uh, when I brought it up, they said, oh, well, yeah, we would be very open to hearing what, you know, what you guys have to offer. Um, so there's, there's still very much, I think, uh, an attitude that they want to do this on their own. And I think that's true. And, and, you know, in terms of praise, I mean, I think just at least, you know, encouragement quietly um, makes sense. Um, and uh, I, don't think, I don't think we're at the point where anybody... Uh, in Russia or anywhere else thinks that the U.S. is propping up uh, changes in Uzbekistan, but we could get there later. And uh, finally, the question on cotton, um, that is being scaled back significantly. Uh, the new government's promoting horticulture big time, um, and they're, they're, they're finding that that's actually a very profitable um, export if they can, particularly if they can export fresh produce, um, fruits, vegetables, um, and so they're, they're pushing that a lot, and um, you know, they, they, it's unclear how long it'll take to scale back, how, how much dependence they have on cotton, but they seem to be very aware of the problem, and they're very aware of the international campaign uh, that has exposed the forced labor on cotton. So they want to get rid of that black spot on their reputation. So um, we'll see what happens. So it's already 3.30, unfortunately, and we had at least five more questions. So that doesn't seem reasonable <laughs> to go over. I'm sorry for the, the, the person who wanted to ask the question. I just invite you to ask it in a more personal, informal way. I propose we stop here. We have a coffee break for half an hour before the last panel. And please join me in thanking our four panelists.